So I started in car sales in 2014 and started training a lot, just learning sales to the fullest. So you were selling 35 cars a month. Other people that would work with me would know I wasn't the best closer, but what I was, was the hardest worker. I was the most consistent. I sold like 33 to 35. That was my absolute best. So that's probably why you're such a good sales coach because her Mosey said something once and he said that you never question a belief that you truly believe. All right, so today we got Dakota Bailey on the pod and you're out of Indiana. You went full-time in 2021 from uh, have, running a team of uh, on, on the car sales side. Yep. What was like... How, how did you get into real estate in the beginning? And like, just like, let's talk through the journey of how you got up to 20 deals uh, a month. I like it. Yes, sir. So, um, man, that's a, that's a lot to unpack. So basically what I started off with was car sales. And so I started in car sales in 2014 at the end of 2014, uh, started training a lot, just learning sales, like to the fullest, because before that, dude, I was a, a landscaper working physical labor. I didn't even know that I had a sales bone in my buyer. Like, I didn't even know it was possible. And to be honest, in the beginning, I wasn't the best, but I was very enthusiastic and I was very hardworking. Um, so mm -hmm. those two things usually kind of uh, helped me a lot. Um, but the transition from car sales. So the funniest part is I didn't actually go from a car sales manager or managing people. So my leadership skills, I basically had like not a whole lot developed. All I had was my integrity, which I believe is a form mm -hmm. of leadership. And then like my work ethic, which again, like I feel like I was a good example, but I wasn't necessarily over anybody where I was in charge of anybody else. So a transition mm -hmm. from, you know, me being a car salesperson where I'm 100% commission, I'm responsible for myself. And all I have to do is freaking sell cars and I make a lot of money. Like it was a mm -hmm. hard transition from, okay, you, you only have to worry about you to now hiring like the first person. So before it was me and my business partner, Tony, um, and mm -hmm. I was at the dealership running the business on the side. He was doing the marketing, doing the running around, stuff like that. Um, and then I was doing more of the transaction coordination, the, uh, you know, whenever we're flipping a property, the actual like project manager portion. I was basically like doing everything on the back end, finding the money, all of that stuff. And then whenever I quit in 2021, then I hired the first assistant. And then I was like, oh, dang, now I'm responsible for another human being and it was a tough transition to figure out of like, okay, am I leading wrong or is this the wrong person and really figuring all of that stuff out. So, um, yeah, the transition goes from me being a car salesperson, worrying about myself into, okay, now you got an employee or a couple employees because it scaled up pretty quickly to where I got to develop a whole new set of skills that I never had before. So it was a, it was an interesting transition. So you were selling, I think you told me 35 cars a month. 35. Oh, that's like, that's like, that's like two a day. Yeah. That, that was my, I think my best month. I sold like 33 to 35. That was my absolute best, which is crazy timing wise. My average cars was somewhere around like 20 to 25. My 25 was always my goal because at 25, I maxed out my pay plan and I would get huge okay. bonuses. So 25 was pretty normal. 35 is like, that was the most I ever hit ever, but I was car salesperson of the month for a while. Uh, and um, yeah, I had a, had a decent amount of salesperson of the years. And what I always tell people, dude, and this is good to remember and to re like help remind people, I was not the best salesperson. I legitimately was not. I'm not just saying that to be humble. Other people who would work with me would know I wasn't the best closer, but what I was, was the hardest worker. I was the most consistent. I was like, dude, I, I was so consistent and I was organized. And so those things, whenever you're organized, consistent, I also had a lot of integrity. So I treated people right. And I wasn't just worried about the big commission. I was worried about what they actually wanted. When you mm. put all those things together, like it helped me to become the salesperson of the month, not because I was the best salesperson, but because I like, I believe because I worked the hardest, honestly. Yeah. I love, I wrestled in, uh, in school and in college and like, I love like the, the effort in equals the effort out. Like that's like, that's my jam, dude. Yep. The, I was, okay, what, this is a hot take. What do you think of Andy Elliott? Andy Elliott, dude. Okay, so Andy Elliott, dude, he's, he is a beast. Um, and dude, when I listen to his sales stuff, his sales skills as a car salesman, I think would work really freaking well because car sales is a whole lot less emotional, right? 
It's, it's not like the same as houses. So everything that I learned from car sales, I trans transitioned over to houses because it does translate over pretty well. But when you're pushing somebody to make a decision in car sales, you can push a little bit harder because they already did the research. They already know they want it. They drove it, you know, they like it. So it really does just come down to budget. There's not an emotional attachment as much as like a property and stuff. So I think that you can push a little bit harder. So Dude, he's a killer. He knows what to say. He, he comes up with some good one-liners. He pushes a lot harder than I I would, honestly, because like mm -hmm. I I I will ask questions, but I'm not as like kind of pushy as he is. Um, but yeah, dude, he's a killer. And I the the best thing about Andy is honestly his mindset. His mindset is another level. He is a top-notch mindset guy. The funniest part is he got that way through sales training. Even though I believe that like it's the same thing with Grant Cardone. Their sales abilities aren't the best, but their mindset is unstoppable. So um, yeah. if you want, like, in my opinion, like the best actual salespeople is going to be like Jeremy Lee Miner. I think he is one of the best salespeople I've seen. Pace Morby is a freaking closer. Like those kind of people who are able to provide empathy, understanding, but still ask questions, still kind of push in and not just take the surface answers and not be mm -hmm. pushy. Those are the kind of people that I believe are the best, where they convince the other people to convince themselves. It's not me pushing my thoughts on you. It's you helping you work through your own thoughts. That's what I believe a real good salesperson does. Yeah. Dude, yeah, when I listen to Pace or Jeremy, I'm just like, bro, I want to pay you. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you're just like, they're just so good. Dude, I learned, um, I got to say this too. I learned this from, I can't remember, I don't know if it was you or Gino, but I watched you guys say something that I use. I, I literally put it in my script, dude. I listen to so many different people because I want to learn the best, most effective way. And a lot of times I can hear something. I'm like, dude, that's going to work. So something that you yeah. guys said that was so freaking good that I use 99% of the time is, hey, this is not our offer or anything, but it looks like other investors would be offering somewhere around here to here. What would you say if another investor were to offer you that? And that line, bro has made so much freaking money. So like you guys really did help us a lot with that. All of the people in Wealthy Investor now use it because I put it in our script and then all of our acquisitions guys use that. And we got that from you guys. So I don't know where you got it from, but thank you. Dude, I think uh, we always try to blame other people. So we just came up with that. Like, I mean, I'm sure, like, cause like I think Steve Trang like had the price anchor and then we were like, okay, well it kind of feels awkward when you say it. So it's like, let's just blame this on other people. <laughs> this isn't us. It's, that's a game changer, bro. That was, it's so good because even if like we used to do that in car sales, right? We would blame the manager, yep. but you guys blame mm -hmm. somebody even outside of the organization. That's like, <laughs> hey, the other yeah, dealership would usually offer it for this. What would you say if the other dealership were offered it for it? No. Well, what's the max you pay for it over at that dealership? It's like, dude, it's it's just is it's so gold. So, dude, I'm so Isn't glad we learned crazy? that. Isn't it crazy how just like because I, I think about this all the time because so I do a lot of coaching, right? And I, I like can ask the same question in three different ways and get three completely different answers. Hundred percent. So it's like just by like asking the right question the right way unlocks so much. Like I don't know if it's like how like the psychology. Just like for for example, I've sat on the other side of the table and like someone asked me a question, I like give them a horrible answer. They ask it again a different way. It's like boom, everything just blurs out exactly how it needs to. So like in sales, how do you how do you go about like knowing when is this a good question? Like, how do I frame the question? Um, like, how do you like practice that? Yeah, hundred percent. So the main thing is to have a huge arsenal. Obviously, I got ten different ways to ask about pricing. Right, I have a sequence that I usually go down. So the first thing I usually do is say, "Hey, how much were you hoping for the house?" Uh, most of the time, they're not willing to say. I'm not really sure. You know, I I, I just I I was hoping you tell me. You wrote me the letter. You called me, etc. Okay, well, what are other properties in the area selling for? I want a solid number. I want to talk about specifics. And so a lot of times they want to give you generalities um, and then you got to get them to actually say legitimate numbers. Well, I'd want a little bit more than that. When you say a little bit, how much specifically is that? Because little is relative to everybody. So you got to go from relative terms to specific terms. But anyway, mm -hmm. the more uh, things you have in your arsenal, the better it is. So I just flow with the conversation. So I start off. How much are you hoping for after there, if they don't give me a price and I say, what are other properties selling for? If they give me a price there, they say, oh, my neighbor's house sold for 450. Gotcha. And I know you said yours needed some repairs. So how much were you hoping for yours then? Well, I'd probably be at 380. 
Okay, gotcha. 380, that makes sense. Well, let me ask you this. If we were able to offer you cash and close quickly, what's the lowest you'd be willing to accept? Uh, I'd probably go 360 on it. That'd be the lowest. That makes sense. So if I'm unable to offer you 360, should I not even call you back and tell you what I can do? Well, now you can call me back and you know, as long as it's close. Okay, well, let me do this. Let me see how close I can get to that number and then I'll give you a call back. Now I'm using relative terms in order to give hope in order to do it. So that's another way uh, that I do it. But the main thing is follow the flow of the conversation and know where you're going with it. That's what I always teach is there's different steps. I got five different steps in my sales process. So I do sales coaching and stuff too. But know where the conversation's flowing and let it flow over here because you're going to come back over here. So it doesn't need to be an interrogation where you say, what repairs does it need? Okay, how much do you owe? Okay, what do you want to do next? It, like, it doesn't need to be like that. Let them tell you things and then have the questions that you know you need to ask that lines up. That way it feels like a conversation, but it's actually a script because you know mm -hmm. what questions you need to ask. And so that's the main thing that I do is let it flow. Last thing that I'll say on that is with the pricing thing, if, if I ask those four questions and they're still at retail and they won't come down, then I go and use that same one that you just said. So I'll use that in two scenarios uh, or that you guys taught me. I'll use that in two scenarios. If they say, hey, I want 450 and I'm like, what's the lowest you want to accept? 420. Okay. Well, that's realtor fees. So then what, uh, you know, if I'm unable to offer you that, should I not even call you back? No. Then I go, well, it looks like other investors are paying somewhere around 305 to 310. What would you say if another investor were to offer you that? Now I'm anchoring it. I tell them to F off. Okay, well, what's the closest you would come to that that would make sense for you? And if they say, I'm not going below 420, disqualified, moving on and put them on a drip campaign to follow up. I'll also mm -hmm. use that if they say, I'm not giving a price. And so if I say, how much are you hoping for? I don't know. You sent me the letter. You tell me. What are other properties selling for? I don't know. I'm not the expert. You are. What's the lowest you want to accept? Uh, I'm not really sure. You, I, I, because they don't want to say the first price because whoever says the first price loses. Then I'll go and say that next line. Same thing, whether it's retail or whether they won't give me a price, then I have the flow of where I'm going to go with it. Other investors be off in 305 to 310. What would you say? Now they feel like I made them an offer, even though I never technically made them an offer. We set a number. Now they're willing to tell me what they're willing to do. So the main thing with conversations, I would say, and like asking the right questions is just letting it flow, having a big arsenal of knowing what to say and having it in your subconscious. It's not enough to just like, you know, have it in your consciousness where you read it in a book once. You need to practice saying this stuff out loud over and over again. So when you go to say it, it's just automatic. Yeah. Dude, I, I can tell whenever you say it, it's like, yeah, I've said this like 10,000 times at least yep. or probably more, but that's like textbook looping right there. And I love how you like built that out as like, that's like the script because you're like, okay, the, the question of like, you know, so if like we weren't able to be close to 360, like would it even make sense for us to come back and uh, offer you? And then like that line right there is so powerful because it just gives you so much like leverage in the conversation. A hundred percent. It's like, and it's good on every side. So like if you're doing dispo, if you're doing acquisitions, whatever, it's just like a great question to, to ask. Yeah. And dude, I, got, like, I have so many like that too. So many questions. That's just one example for pricing, which I feel is people's biggest struggles. There's like, mm -hmm. I have hundreds of questions. It's very similar to that. What's your favorite question to ask a seller? Oh man. Okay. I'll give you one that I haven't used already. Cause my absolute favorite that you guys need to memorize in my opinion is if I'm able to offer you cash and close quickly, what's the lowest you're willing to accept? Now, let me rephrase that really quick though. If I'm able to uh, offer you cash and close whenever it's convenient for you, what's the lowest you're willing to accept? Because sometimes quick will scare people. That's my favorite mm -hmm. one to ask. My second favorite question would be, are you looking for the highest price or the simplest process? And so that question right there helps a lot to understand what they're actually trying to accomplish. Now, I will say this. I just locked up a deal yesterday in Florida. Our first deal, dude, let's freaking go. Our That's first deal in Florida. Um, she said she wanted the highest price. I said, okay, that I'm with you. So I'm, I'm, my goal in sales is to qualify or disqualify. It's not to like convince them of anything. It's to find out, are we good to work together or are they better to go somewhere else and then help them to figure out what that is. So when I asked her, do you want the highest price or the simplest process? She said, highest price. I said, okay. When you say highest price, how much is that? She said 450. Well, 450 is retail. So she's right. She did want the highest price. 
So then I said, okay, if I'm able to offer you cash and close quickly, what's the lowest you're willing to accept? She said, 375. Okay, well, we're in the ballpark now. So if this thing doesn't need any repairs, which it didn't, now we're in the ballpark. I'm like, okay, well, let me see how close to that I can get and I'll give you a call back. So she said she wanted the highest price, but she actually didn't. She just wanted to get the highest price out of the wholesalers. So asking these questions, clarifying what those mean, which I have this all in a script too of like, this is what exactly it means. This is what the quickest process means out of those two, which one makes the most sense, asking different questions like that. But that question alone is going to help you figure out if it makes sense. It's not the exact answer, but it's going to help you find out if it makes sense to work together. And now the best line that I ever got from Jeremy Lee Miner afterwards is if you say you want the uh, highest price or the simplest process and they say, I want the simplest process. OK, that usually looks like you give up equity for speed and convenience as cash as is, you know, give them the example of what you do and then say, is that what you're looking for? Yes. And then here's the most important question to ask. Well, why do you feel that way though? And what do they do? They start telling you all the reasons of why they think that makes sense for them. What are they now doing? They're selling themselves on going with you before we even got to a price. They're saying that you're the answer they're looking for. You're not telling them, you're not selling yourself. They're selling themselves and they're telling themselves, this is what I'm looking for. Dude, I, I love that. That's like such a good flow. I'd be really curious to like dive into like what your sales process is. It's not, I mean, I'm sure it's like the structure wise, like similar, but the ways that you take people through the thought flows is like really, it's like really creative. I've not, I've not heard someone do it exactly like that. It's fucking sick, yeah. actually. Thank you, man. I, I've listened to a lot of people. I've listened to Steve Trang, Brent Daniels, Pace Morby, uh, Grant Cardone, Jeremy Lee Miner, the Wolf of Wall Street guy, Jordan Belfer. Like, I took everything that I've learned from them and I've like read so many books and I combined it to what works the best for us. So yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time and I still learn, dude. I'm always learning. Yeah. Sales is always evolving. If, if you don't get better at sales all the time, oh, just in business. Like I heard this the other day. It's like, just to stay the same in the same position in your business, you have to get better. Yeah. So like, if you're not getting better more than everyone else is, then like, you're just going to go and you're just going to lose. Like, you're never going to actually improve. So like the, the level of discipline, like, dude, okay. So I want to talk about this Then that you mentioned this. So you said that you closed the deal in Florida. Did you close that deal? Yeah. Okay. So I think you guys are just for context. Y'all are doing like 20 deals a month in Indiana. And you open up a new market in Florida and you're the one closing the deals. So like, talk to me about like the thought process and like why you're doing that. Because I think there's a lot that can be, can be learned and unpacked from this. Dude, that is such a long answer that I would have to get into a lot. So it's a long process because I talked to you off camera about restructuring that I'm having with my business partner. And so this is actually not an expansion of the company up in Fort Wayne. This is with a new partner down here because I had different uh we were talking about different things there um okay i, I don't know if i want to share it all on camera right now or like with the public or anything no, but, it's completely valid, yeah. yeah but but I'll, I'll just say that i'll i'll stop right there and like we can keep air and all of it but that's what i'll say about it is like we had a disagreement on a split because i felt like i'm taking this thing to the moon and i can go like i i plan on bringing it national at some point mm -hmm. but it just doesn't make sense to do that if uh the other partner doesn't want to put in the same amount of effort or work or anything like that so then what I decided to do is like, I want to not be in Indiana in the winter time. Right. And so, uh, so then I decided, okay, well, I will start a business down here. And then I had a friend from wealthy investor from Ryan Pineda's program that said he wanted to move to Florida too. And so we decided to open up the business down here. And so what I wanted to do was make sure like, uh, that one, it's actually possible down here, which I believe is possible everywhere, but I wanted to actually do it. And then two, I want to show him exactly our process and stuff because the whole plan with me and him is, hey, we'll be 50-50 in the beginning. And then I want to position you as the CEO as opposed to me being the CEO, which I'm the CEO of the company up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. But I want him to be the CEO down here, 50-50 in the beginning. I'll help you uh, bring up a team. I'll position you as the CEO. And then I want to step away and then just be 20% owner. And then he brings the thing up to the moon. But I'll, I'll teach him all the systems process, help him get started. And for me... I'll be honest with you, like it is kind of fun to restart because like, dude, it's been so long since I got to close some deals again. And like, I forgot what it was like and the adrenaline and stuff and like all of that. Um, so it's just so fun to to go back and start the grind again. And 
one thing that you talked about is you always got to keep getting better in business, right? And so what that means is you're experiencing stuff that you have not experienced. You have to become somebody that you never become. You have to do things that you've never done. And that is freaking difficult. So it's kind of exciting restarting and be like, all right, dude, I've done this before. I did forget how hard it was in the beginning too, but we yeah. got a deal now. And like, it's just exciting because sometimes you do have that self-doubt of like, dang, I got this far here. But that was six years later. And then you forget that, dang, when I go back, it's hard again. But I know I've been here before. And so I trust myself a lot more. Whereas I'm in uncharted territories whenever I'm running the other business. I got like 15 mm -hmm. people working for us now. I don't know how like every time we expand, like, dude, I've never done it. Well, I've done this before. <laughs> so it feels a little bit easier. And like, OK, I know what to do here. And I trust myself a little mm -hmm. bit more. Yeah, like, what? Well, th that is such a good point, dude. It's like I tell people, it's like, okay, they're like, I want to grow my business. I'm like, dude, like, it's, it's, and they're like, it's hard. Like, why am I like not, not able to do it first try? I'm like, dude, it's like, imagine if you try to do a backflip first try. Yeah. Like, are you going to land it? Probably not, dude. That, that's what you're trying to do. It's like, you're trying to do something completely new that you have no idea about. You're going to spend a lot of money to learn. And, you know, even if you have coaches, like, you can get the right idea, but there's still like little nuances of like your skill sets, your beliefs, your, character traits, all the different things, your leadership abilities that are going to bottleneck you until you release those things. Yep. Um, dude, like that's, that's such a good point. Okay. So when you were starting out again, down in Florida, what was the strategy you used? Like knowing what you know, how to grow a business to, you know, a pretty large scale, knowing what you know from there, what are you, what, what was your strategy coming in to, to basically launch this, you know, I, I could say it like a new market, new business, but what was your strategy? Yeah. 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 So my thought process was, and I haven't, it's so hard because like you basically have to break habits that have worked knowing what I know now, even though it worked. And so I find myself going back into it, even though I want to try something different. So what I mean by that is I want to only wholesale. Cause like, dude, do you flip too? Or do you guys only wholesale? Oh, uh, we do some wholesales, but nothing too heavy on the flip side. Okay. So we flipped because Ryan, Ryan Pineda convinced us like, bro, you got to flip, you got to maximize it. So we started doing it and then he started wholesaling only. I'm like, bro, you told us we switched our whole plan because of you. <laughs> but anyway, so we flipped and we wholetail a lot. But dude, when you flip and wholetail, the whole process and the back end that you need to do is just insane. And the amount of money that it costs in order to do all that, I don't think people get it. So like mm -hmm. we've made uh, like a couple million dollars the last couple years. You know how much money we have in our bank account? Like. 100k at all times it just who is like this like yeah. 100 300 100 300 dude we don't have more than 150 200k in our bank for longer than a week honestly because we have so mm -hmm. many flips going on i think we're in the middle of uh um freaking let me just like your equities it, your equity is so high you're just not like super liquid exactly and so i was like dude yeah we're in the middle of 29 flips right now so it costs a lot of money to do that. Even um, if you have 10, like, for context, even if you have 10K, which 10K is a very low entry of like cash out of pocket, that's 300 grand. Yes. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's a little low entry. Like that's not a lot of money. And like, if you have to come out more than that, then like, it's like adds up to be a ton. A hundred percent. We have that many projects going on. Like uh, it, it, it just, the, the cash flow goes out really fast. So I was like, okay, we're gonna go down to Florida which is even more expensive. So we're only going to wholesale and we're going to go freaking like we spent like 370 K in marketing or something like that. I was like, all right, we're going to do cheap marketing and we'll go higher commissions. Cause like sales is what I'm the best at dude. Like sales, like it's in my, like now I feel like it's in my blood, even though it's not, it wasn't there. I wasn't good at it. I learned it, but I wanted to go lower cost. So we did bandit signs. Well, let's not, mm -hmm. let's not tell uh, poor St. Lucie that, but uh, we do bandit signs. Um, and, uh, like it's cheap and we, that's how we got our deal, our first deal off of that. Um, and I want to do more like high, higher commissions because you only have to pay out commissions once you already make the money. So I'd rather do higher commissions, do door knocking, different things like that. That doesn't cost as much. Um, but I also want deals right now. So we ended up spending some money in marketing, but that's what I did differently. I also set all the systems up right away. Like before we started and waited till we got our first deal and stuff, I just started it all right away. So now we got like, you know, the um, actual Gmail account. We started the Google, uh, my business. We got the QuickBooks. We got everything linked up. Like everything to get this thing to grow very quickly is already built. And so it took a lot of time, like, well, not a lot of time. It took us like a week, honestly. It took us like a week yeah. in the beginning 
to get it all there where we're not even generating any money, but I know that it's going to happen. Whereas before I didn't know it was going to happen. And so we wanted mm -hmm. to wait until it was built and then build really quickly on the back end. We build on the front end to where, dude, we can, we can do 10 deals down here and it'll be easy because it's yeah. not going to take as much effort. So that's the different mm -hmm. strategies is wholesale only is, is what I would prefer to do. That's going to be the goal. But also I have a lot of integrity. So if I tell somebody I'm going to do something and I don't have a contingency in there, we're going to close it and we're going to have to wholetail it. So it just is what it is. Cause I'm not going to, I will not tell somebody we're going to buy their house and then like just back out unless I have a contingency in there and I tell them, give me two weeks. You know, I'm okay with that if I tell them straight up, but I don't want to mm -hmm. have them thinking we're going to do something and then not be able to do it. So wholesale only is the goal down here instead of flipping and all that other stuff. And then lower lower cost on the marketing and do more guerrilla like style marketing. Yeah, I like that. That's that's kind of funny, man. It's a uh, every wholesaler wants to flip and every flipper wants to wholesale. Yeah. It's the the age old adding. There's definitely like a sweet spot, like doing a little bit of both because it's like the wholesales, you know, especially now that you're in Florida, like where the price. I don't know the price points in Indiana, but I think they're like probably like the low two hundreds. Yep. Um, if you go into these markets where it's like three hundred fifty, four hundred fifty thousand dollar median home price, like your wholesale rips are like sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety grand, and it's like that is pretty fucking nice, yeah. you know. It's pretty great when you hit uh, 90 k rips, and that just makes life a little bit easier. Yep. But cash, the cash conversion cycle on wholesales is so fast. Yep. So some of my friends like started have like are doing land deals too, and like they'll get a contract today, but it's not going to monetize to like. August. <laughs> it's like, yeah. dude, like you have to wait so long for money. And like, that's like what Robert Winsley, his whole thing on investor lift or whatever. He's just like always talking about the cash cycle. Yeah. So. And the hard part for me for wholesale specifically, and this is what I told my business partner down here is it's almost the same process as a flip. You still got to find mm -hmm. the private money. You still got to get insurance on it. You still got to turn utilities on. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens on the back end. So like you have to yeah. build a whole new system in order to do that. Whereas like, dude, For I don't sure. think that people realize if you're just doing assignments or double closes, you don't like the systems like, dude, it's so easy in my opinion. Like it's actually easy, like system wise, mm -hmm. system wise, not the closing and this, that stuff, but the actual systems of like, okay, I got it under contract, send in the title company, get clear title and then go schedule closing. Like that's it. You have like, you have like two scripts and then you have like, a buyer's list and that's, and then you send it to a title company. That's like basically the entire yes. systems in the marketing, yeah. course. but flipping, it's not like it's a complex business. Yeah. Flipping or wholesaling the process that you have to build on the back end is just so much more work. And it's not to say that we won't do it. I would just prefer not to. Cause like if, if we're good at marketing and sales and that's what our skill set is, those are the two best things that I think I'm the best at. I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty decent at project management. But usually you got to get burned a couple times to find out who the good contractors are and all that stuff. Like it's just it's not a process that I enjoy as much. I like closing deals, making money. And dude, here's the stuff that nobody really talks about. When you're in the middle of a flip, a lot of times you're not even sure if you made a good decision. You're like, I think I think we're good. I'm pretty sure. Then it gets on the market. It sits there for five months. You're like, all right, I was wrong. All right, we lost money on that one. So like. You know Damn. way faster if you got a good deal or not, which gives you more confidence. And I'm more of like, dude, give me quantity because that fuels me. When I close a deal and I know it's a good deal, like we already, we closed this deal up yesterday. We got it for 375. We already got offer for 390. Now I know it's a deal. Now I feel good. I feel more confident where I can go on to the next one. When you're in the middle of a flip and it's, you're pouring money into it, you're pouring money and you're like, dude, I don't know. I don't. Like, you're getting stressed and everything yeah. just kind of like. Yeah, you don't know. And so like, that's the difference is it, it takes away some confidence and people think that you have more confidence, the more you do, which is true. But the, the full, full transparency is you don't always have a hundred percent certainty until it's done. Like it just straight yeah. up is what it is. Well, sometimes I feel like the, you get the market to deal with, especially like if you're doing ARVs, I feel like ARVs are all over the place, especially if you're not seeing like the other houses, like stepping inside of them. Cause you know, you may not, if you don't have like the, you know, you know, like what level of finishes they use, was it something weird that happened in that deal? Like there's so many different nuances and I feel like an ARV, whereas like if you sell like as is homes that are all like kind of cookie cutter, it's definitely a lot easier because it's like, okay, roughly like we're going to be close. And then like, you're right. Like if you're under contract and you have five people come and tell you an offer, 
then you know like kind of what what it's worth yep. you know like you have an idea yep. so you can move through that's yeah that's a it's an interesting perspective i love hearing like a flipper's perspective of like wholesale and how much better it is and then like hearing all the wholesalers like oh i'd love to flip <laughs> so here's the other thing too that's kind of funny though we do between our wholesales and our flips so in indiana um so just for context last year sold wise we sold 98 properties that were either wholesale or wholetail um mm-hmm. and then we flipped 31 actual flips so we still mostly wholetail and wholesale more up there it's just like it is more work and then like we have all the back end already there to wholetail so it really doesn't matter us whether we wholesale or wholetail it it's about the same we yeah. just try to save on the closing costs but we're still sure. probably 80 percent wholetail or wholesale business even though we still have the pains of the flipping <laughs> that's hilarious so up in the uh, up in indiana i know like are you guys still like looking to scale that company? Like, um, and like, what are some of the struggles you guys are facing right now? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely uh, scaling the company a hundred percent. The difficulties specifically right now is the stuff that I'm like still unsure about how much I want to go all the way into it. It's mostly with my partner and I, and um, just where we go vision wise and stuff, but. What I would mm-hmm. say is like, once we figure this out and figure out exactly what's going to happen and how we're going to go about it, that uncertainty, like any uncertainty that you have, I feel like stops you from making decisions because that big decision changes all of the rest of the decisions, which changes a lot of other people. So that's one big, big thing that uh, uh, kind of struggling with. The other one that uh, we're struggling with is we built so fast, right? Just we, we didn't care. Okay, dude, let's freaking make a mess, scramble it. We're pretty organized compared to a lot of companies, I feel like. But at the same time, we need more systems process. We need to know who is exactly doing what. We need to know if it makes sense for that person to do these things or we should hand that off. And so more clarity. And then also I like to pay based on performance. And so then we need to know what areas are specifically what you're doing that the more you do of, do more of, the more money that you will make the company, which will then make you more money because we'll pay a bonus. So we actually just signed up with Gary Sharper, um, or Gary Harper, I think his actual name is, but with Sharper. Um, and mm-hmm. so we just signed up with them. We're actually going there in March, uh, the whole entire team to help with that process and hopefully help us nail down exactly what everything looks like. What is everybody doing? What is their roles? And just get very, very clear on all of it and make sure that it makes sense. So. That's the next step for us. We decided not to expand a whole lot this year. It's going to be a systems process thing, which I think by at the end of the year, that's going to set us up to just freaking go, in my opinion, possibly nationwide where we can take this and go everywhere. Yeah, I was going to say like, that's kind of like been, was like the the mistake we made too is like when it's like oh let's just like keep doing it more and then like maybe it'll work and then like you realize like you break so much shit and you don't know what you're doing as you like try to scale from like you know 200 to 300 or 400 or whatever like i our, when the market was hot like our best month ever was like just under 460 yep. and we're like dude like let's fucking go we're gonna hit like 7 million this year <laughs> and then uh next thing you know it's like no, not not really. It doesn't actually work like that because you know you don't. You're not as good as the leaders you need to be. Your team's not as good as it needs to be. Your processes aren't as good as you need to be. Like shit's just flying everywhere. So like I think that's like a really good move to like tighten everything down. Make sure your core team is like super good, super strong, and then like you can just build around that. Like yep. I think if you don't have that strong, like and every you know, I guess you don't necessarily know what foundation to build until you're like ready to like actually like take off until you experience a lot of it. So working with someone who's done it is definitely like going to help a lot. Yeah. I want to say like, something on that too, of like, it's, it's a way different mindset. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Like it's new territory, right? The way that we did it in the beginning was the exact opposite of that, because that's how most people never get anywhere. Right. They just, Oh, I got to plan it all out. I got to make sure it's organized. I got to focus and I got to make sure that I do it this way. No, you don't. You need to go freaking make a mess make some freaking money, be as organized as you can be, but get your top line revenue high enough that you're actually worth it. Because what most people do is like, oh, I gotta go save money over here on my construction costs. So let me go and find the best pricing. Let me go save over here and do this. You're saving, but no, you're not, dude. You need to get that top line gross revenue high enough that if you actually save some money here, you're making you know an extra 500 to a million dollars. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, dude, I think like, until you hit like a million dollars a year, like you just need to fucking grind. Mm-hmm. 
you just need to go do more deals, make more offers and like figure out how to, how to make that happen. And then like, once you do that, like, then it's like, okay, let's get strategic. Yep. We're around hundred K a month, 80, hundred K a month. Like let's start to really build this. Like, I mean, you want to build the foundation right before that, but that's when you really want to slow down and be like, okay, let's, let's actually make tactical decisions here. Exactly. Have you, did you watch Jeff Bezos is a, podcast he did with Lex Freeman. Uh-uh. You should watch that. But one of the things he talks about, and I think this is like such a good decision-making framework. That's what he like, dude, this dude, I consistently, like, I, I believe this before, but like now I a hundred percent believe it after watching this podcast with Jeff Bezos is decision-making the quality of your decision-making completely determines how much success you'll have in business because do they have so many processes in like so many filters for making decisions. So he calls this thing one way decisions and two way door decisions. Mm. So basically a two way door decisions, like something like, um, should we increase marketing or not? Basically like turn it up. Does it work? If not, turn it down. You can basically open the door and then close it if you want to. The one way door decisions, he basically says, it's like, let's say this is like opening up a new marketing or a new market, or maybe like adding a new, like, let's just say you have a service based business, like opening up a new location. Like that's like a hard thing to decide. And he said the one way door decisions need to be decided by executives and like C level people. And like they need to take a lot of time um, to make those decisions because you can't easily redo them or undo them. And then two way door decisions, he says like the entire team, like he said, basically this should be made by individuals or small groups of people at any level because you can just go in and go out. It doesn't really matter. Wow. And with, I, that's like such a genius way to look at it because that's really all it is. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of freaking sense. And yeah, I love that because there's a lot of things that, if you make a mistake and you mess it up, cool. Close the door, freaking change, turn, go and see if it works again. But yeah, there's some things that you make a mistake. That's a big mistake. Like that can, that can yeah. hurt the company. And yeah, that's, that's awesome. I like that. The, so what do you think like from your vision, if you were to like, let's just say double the Indiana, Indiana company, let's say systems and processes are all in place. Like how do you see that? Like, basically going from, you know, closing 10 to 15 deals a month to 20 to 30 deals a month. Yeah. Um, and that's a tough question. <laughs> and so right now we're usually doing somewhere between like, usually somewhere between 15 and 30 average ended up being 20. So, okay. Um, I guess for me, well, so I guess they go 40 then. Yeah. To get to 40, I think that, you know, if you look at the population of where we're at, the amount of deals that we do per per the population is insane. And so for me, it's like, okay, systems, processes, and then also we just got to straight up hit new areas. But I'm not the kind of person that likes to do a whole lot more work and then make the same amount of net money, which I feel like happens a lot because it's for clout and stuff. And so uh, that's what I have to look at because our population in Fort Wayne, Indiana is 265,000 people. That was in 2021. Yeah. And so we're in a 45 minute radius. So let's just say 350,000 with everybody that we're hitting, right? And we're doing 20 some deals a month. That's insane for the amount of people that we have because I believe that um, marketing is really strong. Like my business partner is a really good marketer, pulls lists. Like we try to use that money as effectively as possible. And the sales skills, in my opinion, are like top notch. Like I believe our sales guys are like some of the highest levels because like they, they like practice every day. They learned a lot. And like, I believe that I took all the best scripts from everybody that I know and then created it for them. So I know it works really well. So um, I think that we have the right people. We have the right team. I think that honestly, we need to go into new markets, but with new markets comes like, okay, now a whole lot of other stuff is scrambling. And do we have the back end in order to handle it? So if we were just wholesaling, yeah. easy, easy, bro. We can just turn off and I've thought about it. The thing that's hard for me is I have project managers and I have an agent on our team that like likes to have that and makes money. I thought about just, all right, if we turn this off, we only did wholesaling. We could ramp this thing up because we have all the back end that we, we could do a massive amount of deals because there's so much more to do. We don't have utilities, insurance, all this other tasks. Um, mm -hmm. So like it, we could do it if we really wanted to. And so I guess that's where we have to figure out what exactly we want. But for me, it's not about making more money because I don't really need more money, honestly. It's about like helping the team to make more money now and like get them to their goals. Like that's that excites me more, dude. I hit my goal and it's for me, it's just kind of fun now. It's like, all right, dude, let's let's have a better life. Let's have some fun because like I hit my goals. Like I, you know, I'm I'm good. So now it's time to like help other people and to pour into them and then help them grow this thing. And like, yeah, really, 
really have the buy-in from them. So something else that I'm going to be doing in the near future is paying based on a net profit for certain key people who are helping the thing grow. So that way they're even more invested. But that's my goal for growing this whole thing is like just bringing a team and then helping these people who've been with me since the beginning become leaders themselves and then just keep leveling up. Like for me, it's just like fun. It's like growth and like helping other people to get to where they want to go. That for me is like the most fun thing in the world. I love that. Dude, that's like such a, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause like, if you don't want to see other people win more than you want to win, then like you're going to struggle at like becoming a great leader. And like, it sounds like, or in a great coach, that's probably why you're such a good sales coach is because you want other people to win more than you. And like when they win, that that excites you more than like if you were to win. 100%. And I think that's kind of cool. 100%. And it's so funny. I actually, I, I would love to say something on that because that mindset shifted when I started working with other people. Because if you've ever been in car sales, dude, it is cutthroat. When I first started, yeah. bro, I didn't. I, I was I was broke, dude. I was freaking I was uh, I was 20 years old. I never made over $12 an hour in my life. I was working 60 hours a week. I was trying to find a job every winter. I was a mechanic. I worked in a factory. I freaking drove to Texas and worked on a little thing at a gas station for like two weeks. Like, dude, I did whatever it took to survive. Then I went into a dealership and dude is doggy dog there. They don't want you to win because anytime you win, you're taking from them in their mind. So that's the way that they viewed it. So that's the kind of mindset that I had is like, all right, you want to compete? I'm ready to compete, dude. Let's freaking go. And so what I what I realized and what I developed afterwards is, dude, I have a competitive nature in me. I want to win. I'm sure you do, too. And anybody that has this has a competitive nature. And that's okay to have the competitive nature. What I found is I'm also a believer in Jesus. And so what I found is like, does this actually serve and help like his purpose, his mission and stuff for me to compete, bring other people down? Other people don't have to go down for me to win. So what if I did this? What if I did everything that I could possibly do, be everything that I could be, want to win so freaking bad and be everybody, but then also bring them up the whole entire time and pour into them as much as I possibly can. So they're the best they can be. And I still want to my best. I still want to be their best but I'm never going to hold them down from them being their best ever uh, because I believe that I'm just going to get better and continue to grow and I'm going to help them do the same thing. And if they ever surpass me, then that means I got to work even harder in order to beat them. But like for me, it's like I'm going to never hold somebody down from reaching their potential because that just, I believe that's what God put me on this earth to do was help people reach the potential that they're trying to go to. Yeah, dude. I I think that's like such a good like lesson. I, I'd be curious, like, no, like what was it just like something you just thought about? And you're like, this doesn't serve me anymore. And like, this is just like not a belief I can have to get to the next level. Or was it just like you kind of reflected and like, was there some kind of like lesson that triggered the the reflection? Or are you just more of like a reflective person? Like, yeah. I, I'm curious like, how you came to that realization. I, I would say I'm more of a reflective person because I really do think about it. And honestly, for me, it's just like, it's a hard thing, dude, because when you're in a dealership, you become friends with people. And I'm, I was, I'm a very, it's interesting how I have like two sides to me, right? I'm a very social person and most people consider me an extrovert, but I can mm-hmm. also sit there and freaking grind and work for a very long amount of time without talking to anybody. But like Mm -hmm. I have both sides of me. And so I'd be sitting there like this, just at the office, just sitting there. Everybody else is talking to me, joking. I'm just sitting there busting out phone calls, working all freaking day, right? And so, Mm -hmm. but eventually I became friends with some people because it just kind of actually like naturally happens. Like I become friends with people because I am very extrovert and I care about people and I, I want them to do well. But what I see happening is it's, it's a struggle for me that I have to think about when I'm sitting there having a conversation with my friend and there's an up on the freaking lot. And guess what? Who's going to go get it? Me or him? Me or my friend? I care more about him. And so I'm like, dude, I and I hear about their struggles, right? I'm doing very well financially because I was freaking crushing it. I was making a lot of money. I got some money saved up. They're telling me how bad they're struggling. Well, dude, what do I freaking do? I'm like, all right, bro, yeah. you, you go get it. When like, does that actually serve them? Does that actually help them? And so for me, that was like the start of this whole loop of like, dang, don't be friends with people because if you're friends and you care, then now you're actually going to you know, lose your success and stuff. So that was the whole start of my entire process of like standing there next to my friend and then being like, all right, bro, like you go get it or like, you know, all of that stuff. That was the start of the reflectiveness on it because my that's cool. solution was don't be friends with people. And like, that's not, that's not, 
<laughs> that's not the solution. That's like a, a rule or a, like a direct one way street to unhappiness right there. Mm-hmm. The uh, so when you when you do that, I'm assuming what happened is nothing changed in the amount of deals you closed or the amount of cars you sold. Um, oh, you mean so? No, nothing. So like saying, "Hey, bro, go get that one." No, what happens is, uh, that happened, and then I thought about it all, and then I changed my mindset on the way that I thought about you know winning and what that actually means, and then for me, it just created a new happiness because. I, I, I'm very in, like, I do think about a lot of weird, weird stuff that I think that some people don't think about. So I've thought yeah. about, okay, if somebody beats me, does that make me less than what I was? And the answer is no, right? Somebody could still be better than you, but it doesn't take away any of my abilities, right? So then I'm like, oh, okay, so it doesn't matter. If somebody beats me, I'm still just as good as I was and I can still get better and stuff. And I'm like, oh, that made me feel better. But then I thought about it and I'm like, dude, you know what really sucks is when like if you think about time and error and where you're at in your life, like let's say that you're competing against Michael Phelps. You could be the freaking number two and you're the absolute just crushing it. But because you existed at the same time that he's competing, now you're not freaking the number one guy and nobody knows who the frick you are because somebody else was just a tiny, 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 tiny bit better. And so now everybody knows him. So I'm like, dang. That's kind of hard too. So those are, I haven't exactly worked through all of those thoughts, but I've thought about that. It doesn't take away my abilities, but dang, it does kind of suck whenever you're being compared to the person right next to each other. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think like, I was actually talking about this last night. Uh, not this exact thing, but such similar stuff. I think like what it does is it forces you, because I used to be like uber competitive and like it would basically ruin like everything fun. Like when I was in high school, because I was like, dude, if I'm not winning, like, what am I, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm the best. Like, that's the bottom line. And, um, but what I realized is like, dude, like maybe I just should compete against myself and not worry about like how I do relative to everyone else. So like, but also like someone asked me, he's like, well, don't you think that's like an ego thing? I'm like, I feel like I don't have like a very much of an ego, you know, I'm confident, but like my ego, I don't like let it get in the way of my decisions and things that I should do and yeah, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like, if you can compete against yourself, where was I going with this? My brain went away. <laughs> you, <said the> <laughs> you had last night. Yeah. The, uh, okay. So yeah, talking about the ego and going away. Yeah, dude, I lost it, bro. That's uh, that's fun. <laughs> that's what happens when you stay up late and wake up early. Yeah, dude. Dude, I started waking up at 4am recently and best thing I've ever done for my life by far. But yeah, dude, when you go to bed at midnight and wake up at 4am, your brain's like a little bit jumbled, dude. So, you know, like, oh, I know. <laughs> trust me, I've done that a lot of times. Like, all right, let me tell this whole story. All right, now I got to give the context. And I forgot it, dude. It happened. Yeah. Dude, it's like raise your hand in class. You're like, wait, well, what were we, what, what's your question again? Mm-hmm. Oh, I have no idea. I have no idea. It's been too long. <laughs> dude, the, uh, but yeah, I, I geek out on like the stuff you're talking about. Like, I am a very much like a in my head, like looking at it, like why, like asking myself questions, like, why do I like look at, like, why is this, like, is this good or is this bad? Like, does this serve me? Like, why do I perceive it this way? Like, why can't I just, like, what if I look at it this way? Like, does that change the way that, like, my life is? Does it make it better? So I think, like, it's super helpful to do that because, you know, Hermosi said something once and he said that you never question a belief that you truly believe. Yeah. And I think that that's, like, that is, like, a crazy thing to think about because if you never, like, if you truly believe, like, the sky is blue, like, you know, we don't ever question that really. But, like, you know, there's things like that in your life that, you don't like that are your biases that you never think about. And so I try to always think about those. A hundred percent. And what ha- what's crazier too, is whenever those things that you think are absolutes and then it ends up not being reality. That's dude, I've had that happen and that crushed my ego. I would say that, you know, I think all of us have a little bit of an ego and I definitely think I have one. I have to watch myself of when it's coming out and showing itself more. But what I've, what I've noticed is I had a huge ego, especially when I was in car sales. Cause like a lot of stuff happened to me when I was younger it was hard and I thought all my bad stuff happened when I was young and then it got better. And then I thought that some stuff was set in stone. And then like, it was literally in my mind, it's a hundred percent guaranteed collapse. And I'm like, dude, my reality got shattered. And I basically had an ego death. I had to recalibrate and figure out what I, who I am, like all of it, dude. So what's crazier is when, yeah, you think something's certain and it's not. So what I found is like, what's helpful for me is I do believe in absolute truth in certain things. But what I found is a lot more stuff is relative than I thought. And so I usually use percentages on probabilities. And like, 
uh, there's about a 99% chance this is going to happen. But I have to leave room for that 1% now because whenever you're 100% certain on something and it comes out not to be true, dude, it messes it messes with your yeah. entire life. Well, you also like don't, if you are, let's just say like you think it's 100% certain, like you, then you don't ever think about the downsides or the risk or the things that could happen. Like, But if you're like, oh yeah, it's like a 95% chance of this happening, then like you see you start to see the the realistic side of what's the 5%? Cause I'm like an extreme optimist. So like yep. for me, like I used to live in fairy tale land. Well, sometimes I still do like my friends make fun of me for that, but like, like, Oh yeah, dude, like we'll do that. No problem. Like whatever, whatever, whatever goal it is. Like, I don't know why I wouldn't achieve it. Like that's fine, whatever. Um, but if you like actually put a probability like, yeah, there's probably like a 70% chance this actually goes through, then you can actually make a realistic plan. Like Ray Dalio talks about realism and how he believes it's like super important. I think that, realism a lot of times like is more like pessimistic mm -hmm. but i think that having that other side for me is like a system that i use that if i didn't have that i would make way worse decisions yep. just because i yeah I, 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 I consider myself like this is the realist scale i consider myself slightly optimistic but i consider myself very okay. close to real but i know i lean on the optimistic side and so yeah the percentages dude like and the coolest part about percentages is you can change the probability, right? That's one of my favorite things about life. Hey, if I wake up and work out every day, I am, you know, 90% more likely to reduce heart disease or to uh, freaking be in better shape to be able to run to play with my kids. Like you can change the odds of a lot of different stuff. And Hormozy actually mm -hmm. talked about that a lot of like, hey, dude, you know, the odds of you becoming a basketball player, professional basketball player, are like less than 1%. But how much do the, those odds change if you're seven foot tall, if you're athletic as crap, if you're like, you know, there's other things that can change the percentages. So you don't just look at it on the surface, but look at what mm -hmm. can you do to move the needle and actually change the percentages more into your favor, because that's possible too. That's such a good point. I've never thought about that. That's a, I like that a lot. It's like, how can you position yourself where this probability goes from like 20% to like 80% exactly. or something like that? Like, that's like a great frame to be in. It's like, I think like naturally, like I've definitely like, I've never thought about it through that like systematic approach, but it's like, okay, this is unlikely. Like, well, if this was to happen, like what things would need to be true in order for this to be the most likely. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I like that. I'm going to, I like to speak in uh and like teach people like logical thought flows yep. because I think it's easier to digest and like people can kind of apply those systems. So like, that's good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. One. And teach yourself questions to ask, dude. I mean, like, just like rich dad, poor dad taught, instead of saying, okay, can I afford this? Yes or no. How can I, what would change my odds on making this more likely like stuff like that? The questions that we ask ourselves, I believe is the quality of the life that we're going to have. And so you need to ask yourself really good questions and better questions that thought provoking like that that can get you where you want to go. So yeah, I love stuff like that too, dude. Dude. <laughs> So, okay. What do you think of this question? So I asked myself this the other day when I was like a little bit stuck um, as I, and like, I asked myself, I said, if, if it was only me in the business, how, how would I make money is basically what I asked myself. Mm. And then like, I started thinking about all these different things of like, oh, if it was only me, I would do this. I would do that. I would do this. And I would probably stop doing this, this, and this that we're currently doing. And I was like, oh, that's like, so, so interesting. So it's like, that's like a question I just had breakthrough, like, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, but it's like, you got, I feel like, do you like, do you like write these things down? Like, do you like write down these questions or you just kind of like always go back to them? Honestly, I should give me one second. Honestly, I should write it down. Uh, and I've actually, it's funny because I thought about doing this a lot. I have a daily thing that I do every single day. I'm going to readjust it. Um, and, and put down journaling because I think it is good to go through, but no, I just think like, like I just think through this stuff. And so the thing that I would think about if I'm asking that question, what would I do if it was just me is, is it just me? And do I want that? Am I okay with that? If that's what I actually want, that's got to be the next question in my opinion of like, okay, I would do this, 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 and this. Can I, well, the next question would be, can I do that with the team still? And it makes sense. And if not, am I willing to lose them? If not, then you need to ask yourself a new question. Um, mm, that's good. Like, is this the team that is actually capable of doing this, this, like this uh, system or whatever yep. method. So yeah, that'd be yeah, the that's... next question that I asked. But yeah, I need to go and actually work this out and like write it all down. I find that my mind thinks way faster than I can write, which is hard for me. So I'm actually, I just got <laughs> done writing a rough draft with a book and then I'm getting on a, a coaching call here in two hours with my coach that I'm super excited about for the book. Um, 
But what I found is, dude, writing drains the crap out of me. It drains me. Even writing out my script drained me so much. And I say this stuff all the time, but like my mind goes like 5 million different places. It's hard for me to get it. But once I get the framework, then I can go in and adjust really easy. But creating the framework is very difficult for me. And so whenever I'm journaling and stuff, I just like, I write so fast. I'm like, my mind can't keep up. And I'm like, oh, what was I thinking about? Oh, it's gone. All right, well, let me, what do I want to think about now? And uh, yeah, so it's hard for me to journal, even though I think it's really good for me. So I'm just going to, I'm going to force myself to start doing it because I do think that I think more whenever I'm doing it. Yeah. That, I was watching a video yesterday on like how to become a great writer from My First Million. They were, they made a video on it. It's, it's pretty good. I would recommend it. What is it? But Who's it by? My, my First Million YouTube channel, but they, they made the video of like how to become a better writer is like the premise. I think, I don't remember the, the title, but it's like maybe three or four videos ago okay. they posted. Um, that was a really good one. Because I, I'm, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, but when I journal, dude, I went back and read some of my things. I like will write like half a sentence and then like be on another sentence and then write another like half it. Like I'm like, dude, what am I even saying? Because yep. <laughs> like same things, like just trying to scribble as fast as I can. Can't even read it most of the time. And it's like half a sentence, whole sentence, some of a sentence, random words. Like, yeah, that's awesome. That's exactly what mine is. Half the time I'm like, I don't know what that says. I have no idea what I just wrote, dude. <laughs> dude, I wrote so like I started doing this this. uh I, I like started like writing notes to people just like out of appreciation. Cause I think it's like a good, oh, yeah. a good habit to do like show appreciation for people you care about. And like <laughs> someone was reading me, like reading me a note, like on a voice memo after they got it. And they're like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> like, this makes no sense. That's, <laughs> like, <my bad. laughs> That's awesome. It's funny, but dude, this has been great, man. Um, I think that, that I could talk about this shit for days. Yeah. For sure, man. I appreciate you having me on. And yeah, it's crazy how it all comes out. Cause like I saw you guys, uh, you and your partner speak on stage. Gene, Gino, is it Gino? Yeah. yeah so I saw you guys uh, speak at Wealthy Investor and stuff. And so that was the first time I ever saw you guys. Or it was Future Flipper then. Yeah, it was Future Flipper then. That's crazy. That's been so long ago, dude. That was, dude, that was kind of cool when we put our Instagram. This is like moderately like cool, right? But put our Instagrams up there. I like opened my phone. I was like, I had like 200 followers on Instagram. I was like, oh, this is so cool. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like instant. That's very Pineda, awesome. Pineda, that, that dude's got so much influence and power. It's crazy how fast he did it too. I, yeah, I often wonder that and reflect on it. And like something that he says, it's like, dude, just straight up, I got to be honest with, is like, I've been working on the creation and stuff like that. He's just like, dude, if you're not getting views and stuff, it's not as good as you think it is. I'm like, He's right. <laughs> it's true, dude. It's true, bro. There's like obviously like a degree of luck in everyone's journey, but dude, he's uh he's really good at talking, man. Yeah. He's a really good he's a good marketer and salesman. Yeah. So, but he's solid. Dude, where can people find you if they have uh, want to reach out to you about doing deals or sales training or anything like that? Yeah. So, uh I put my Instagram handle uh, as my name is Dakota Bailey.in for anybody listening. IN stands for Indiana, which I thought we were going to be like the Indiana people, you know, because you got like, you know, <laughs> Tiffany, Josh and Tiffany High, they're out in uh, Ohio. So they got that market. So we want to be the Indiana guys. So uh if we go nationwide, might have to change that. But my email address, if anybody does want some sales training and actually go through this stuff, say it out loud, like have the scripts, all of that stuff, you can just email me at Dakota Bailey Realty at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, I'm also on Facebook and stuff like that too. So sweet. Sweet. We'll link everything down below. Dakota, dude, this was sick, man. Appreciate uh appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother.